afternoon. Okay. <laughs> this is an absolute favorite topic. It's very pleasing to me that more and more people are becoming so aware of the need to embellish upon those plants that are so important to our pollinators. And I, I've been doing this for years, but there are a lot of newbies at it, and, and that's fantastic. So I'm going to introduce uh, some old plants and perhaps some that you have not met yet. But I do, I do want to make this suggestion. All gardening is a learning curve. And even in my uh, long period of time gardening, Every day is a learning curve and I can only do so much. It's a huge world, this plant world. And so if any of you who are watching today has a favorite plant or something that has really worked well for you, uh, let, let us know. And uh, because it's nice to share experiences, we're only one and we can only do so much. So what I'm going to do today, primarily, when I do these seminars, I spend a lot of time in my own garden, because that's where I have learned so much over the years. There's nothing like hands-on experience, and that certainly doesn't mean that I know it all by any stretch, okay? But just for fun, I've got some things to share with you, some ideas, some how-to, but I'm going to distribute that information throughout the, the session. So let's just go to the first picture, okay? And talk about plants and plants and being out in the garden and hopefully um, being out there with your young ones, if, if you have young ones to share with, because this this is something that they need to be more familiar with to understand and appreciate nature and the need to uh, supplement wherever we can. So I'm going to encourage you to get out into the garden. I'm going to talk to you about some specific plants. It's just scraping the surface. You can't mention all of these plants, but when you're out in the garden, and this particular one is not my garden. It actually is Billie Jean uh, Warhurst's garden. And there are a lot of ornamental grasses in it. And the purple that you see is what my daughter, one of my daughters calls Verbena on a stick. It's Verbena bonariensis. And it is an incredible pollinator. Now, I won't be talking a lot about the taller grasses. Uh, this is uh, Penicetum rubrum in, in the picture, but they are invaluable as we get more into fall and they furnish seeds which bring the birds. And, and actually as they mature now, some of those seeds are available. I love watching the goldfinches in my garden and they certainly visit the things that have seeds. The Vibrina bonariensis will furnish them seeds as the season goes along, and so will the grasses. But that is actually out in the garden itself, and today we are talking about containers. Containers can be out in your garden to supplement, or they can be on a deck, maybe, that's all you have. Things can be lawn blooming and be on your deck. We have people coming in, want to know, what can I grow in sun? Or what can I grow in shade? Or varying degrees of that. So the next picture is something that will tolerate a fair amount of shade. We have two plants here, primarily Fuchsia Gartenmeister, which is the little tubular one that you see. That is a prime hummingbird plant, but other things come to it also as pollinated. It is long blooming. I have primarily in these containers chosen those plants, and most frequently they are annuals, 
because annuals are the ones that bloom for the full season, going through summer and well into fall, frequently until frost kills them, okay? I do mix in some perennials, but perennials for the most part have a period of bloom. And if you are limited in your space, then you need to choose those things that are gonna give you long periods of bloom and therefore support those that, that are pollinators, okay? The other plant in this area is a wonderful begonia. It is a dragon wing begonia. Neither of these plants appreciate the hottest of afternoon sun. They love full morning sun. They love really good dappled light all day. Put them in deep shade. They don't bloom terribly well, okay? So next one, please, Danny. I grow things in far too many pots, <laughs> okay? But it's been my learning curve for all these years. Yes, it does require some watering. However, I use primarily larger pots. When it hits 90 degrees, that pot will dry out in a day and they need watering daily when the sunshine particularly. This happens to be in an area that's shaded from the hottest of the afternoon sun. It gets full morning sun, but it gets dappled light in the afternoon, or it did at this point until I lost a tree there. And what do I have in that area? I have um, New Guinea impatiens, and there are those that like some shade, but there are also those that tolerate a lot of sun. I have Broelia, which doesn't like the hottest afternoon sun and is a great pollinator. There is in that area, of course, that Verbena bonariensis. And there are a lot of complementary plants. When you are planting for pollinators, that does not mean that every plant in that container has to be a prime pollinator. I do have other things that create interest, like the grays that are there. You can choose colorful plants to complement these things. And I do have uh, uh, the guideline, which hopefully you got, that you can follow along with um, if I'm throwing too many plant names at you. There is Terenia, which is a wonderful plant that likes shade in the afternoon. So these are all, if you have some shade, these are the plants that you need to migrate to. And, and in the next picture, a similar kind of thing. <coughs> this is quite a few containers put together which I totally enjoy, but is wonderful for all the pollinators. So it's nice to have groupings. Now, granted, a lot of this is in the ground with just some complimentary uh, containers that are there. And this was taken when the pansies and the violas were still good. So it's late spring. And after those are finished, then it's time to do summer. I concentrate on primarily three seasons of changing out those pots. I do something in the fall that's great for fall going through Christmas and the winter time and that is of interest. And then when they're finished, I go into my summer things and then the late summer fall things. So basically I change out those containers three times a year. And the next one, please do. Okay, let's don't overlook herbs. I have this grouping near my kitchen door where it's convenient for me to go out and use these because I do use them in cooking. And yes, they are wonderful pollinators also. If you allow some of your basil to come into bloom, and I particularly like the blooms of the Thai basil and so do the pollinators. A lot of the oreganos, the thyme, all of these things do produce flowers. Yes, you need to cut back some of those to keep them growing well when you're using them. Uh, the lavender that is in some containers there, the same goes for that. 
you have interest, you have the ability to cook with it, but you leave a few that are allowed to bloom and they really bring those pollinators. So herbs, most of those herbs appreciate full sun. Now, when I say full sun, I'm talking about a minimum of six to eight hours of full sun anytime during the day. Okay. Now, this is actually showing uh, parsley in the front, the deep green, which I use a lot in cooking and, and decorating with. And one should eat the parsley because it's good for you. Don't you just use it as a garnish. But the, the Thai basil is all in full bloom. And wow, does it really bring the pollinators. Some of the thyme is blooming. I have more than one pot of it. I keep one cut back well. I have nasturtiums and calendulas, all of which um, are wonderful in the garden. And in the next picture, you'll see I bring these in and use them. I have the thyme. I have the... Uh, parsley, I have the rosemary, uh, wonderful to use in cooking. But the marigolds, the calendulas, uh, the nasturtiums are all edible actually. And certainly to use as decoration is safe to do that. And all of these are grown organically. So there's, there's no pesticides on them. And, and it's easy to do that because we have Plenty of product today that, that supports our need to grow these things organically. Then in the next one, you'll see again in my garden, this is a tiny portion of uh, the back area garden that I grow my vegetables in. And it has more sun now because unfortunately I lost a couple of large trees back in that area. So I'm growing tomatoes well now. It became an area that is mixed with a lot of perennials, a lot of pollinators, the perennials that are grown in the ground. But there are also containers back there, primarily of herbs, because they bring um, all of the, the wonderful pollinators that keep down the insects. I'm going to knock on some wood because I really have had no issues with insects and problems back there, even in growing uh, my squash and, and other things because my vegetables are kind of scattered among these uh, perennials and these herbs. So it's a little harder for uh, predators to find those things. And it's really working well for me. And so I have these containers of pollinators plus pollinators in the ground that really is helping me to produce some very healthy vegetables. And then the next picture is a little broader view of what that area looks like. This actually was taken in late spring, very early summer. And the uh, turnips that I grew and the mustard that I grew is all coming into seeds and I let it seed until I was ready to put beans and squash into that place. And wow, boy, did the pollinators come to those flowers. So it doesn't hurt to leave a little bit of that up, even when it comes in the bloom, for pollination purposes. This is an area that I enjoy very much. Now, let me mention something because I'm going to talk to you a lot about some new salvias that are on the market. They're annual salvias. The blue spikes that you see in this particular picture is a perennial salvia. And after its first flush of bloom, once the, uh, the blossoms look a little tired, if you cut those back all the way to the foliage, they will bloom again. And frequently, if you cut those back, they will bloom a third time. I love them in the ground. I'm not as fond of them in the containers as I am the annual salvias, because the annual salvias will bloom continuously from early summer right up until frost. Okay, 
I think we're going to shift gears a little bit in the next picture and talk about an area that I really, really enjoy right now, particularly. Oh, at all times. This is uh, steps down into my front yard. There is a re retaining wall there. And I fortunately have a front porch that I love to sit on. I enjoy my morning cup of coffee there because the birds, oh my, my, because I have a large area and uh, a lot of woods and a lot of protection, a lot of shrubs, a lot of supportive plants in addition to these things that we grow in containers. And so it's really alive with the birds. And, and I don't use um, a lot of, I'm not anti-chemical, but I am very judicious use of chemicals. So because of that, I really have a lot of wildlife. A little bit of what I would rather not have, perhaps. But anyway, this is an area right now that is geared for the birds, bees, and butterflies, but primarily for the hummingbirds. And I love to watch the hummingbirds. So what you're seeing here are a couple of plants that they love. It's the Fuchsia Gartenmeister and it's Angelonia because they have open, open blossoms that those little guys can get their beaks into. Now, the gray is Dichondra. It's a gray Dichondra. And I love the way it flows down out of containers. So as I said, even though you're geared for the bear birds, bees, and butterflies, you don't have to have every plant do that. I will say they have a tendency to use some of this dichondra for their nests. I can see them come and pick it and go flying away with it. So that makes it pretty interesting, you know. Now, we're talking about that same area. So I want to take you back to spring. In the fall, I put tulips in the, the bottom of the pots, so to speak. They're gonna stay there for the winter and then they're gonna come up through whatever I planted in them and bloom in the spring. That's beauty for me that I enjoy primarily, okay? This is when the azaleas come into bloom. And, and that is sometimes when I first see the hummingbirds because I love the open blossoms of the azaleas. So we've got a support system going on here. What else is in there? A lot of things that were beautiful over winter, which is kale. Kale is a strong plant that always goes through the winter for me. I don't get that from the cabbage, but I do get it from the cake. It's beautiful because I love the greens and I love the bronzes and they show well with violas and pansies. I lean heavily toward the violas because they are performers and they always have gone through the winter for me. Wonderful pollinators also. But in the late spring, when those kale are finishing up, they send up those tall spikes of the yellow blossoms, which is what you're seeing in that background. Again, wonderful pollinator plants that you just don't think about, you know? So I'm beginning that really uh, pollinator thing in the very early spring. When these violas are finished and I, and I redo these pots, um, then I'm going to plant for summer. What do I put in for summer? This is actually last year. And that pentas, it's the red that you see up there, is one fantastic pollinator plant. I was gathering up a few pots to bring up to show you today. And there were so many bees on there. It was incredible. They come in different colors. Now, you'll be told that the hummingbirds will go to the red. I watched this almost every morning 
And I've discovered that they go to the blues and the purples and the others just as much. And it is not necessarily the red that they go to first. This is a wonderful shade of, I'm not gonna call it purple, but it's lending in that direction. What do you call that, Danny? I, mean, I call it purple, actually. Okay, well, we'll call it purple. <laughs> pinkish purple. It's, it's a pinkish purple. It was alive with these beautiful big bees yesterday. And, and other things come to it too. And Peter Hogarth, our manager here, said to me this morning, Peg, do you know that makes the greatest cut flower? So these are versatile things. And if you deadhead, and, and we'll talk about that in just a little bit. If you deadhead, now and then, when you see that a blossom is finished, it again will bloom until frost kills it, okay? What looks good with that? Let's stop and talk for a minute. Petunias are wonderful. And that's pretty complimentary for that. This one happens to be Supertunia Bordeaux. And really is a fantastic plant too, because again, it's an open blossom. The little hummingbirds can get their beaks down inside, but other things enjoy this also. Uh, this particular one doesn't have to be deadheaded. Sometimes you need to trim it back a little bit because they do grow beautifully. And um, since they're in containers, I don't mind using um, the organic fertilizers. And there's a petunia feed that really does work well with this. It's from Jack's Classic, which I normally use a blossom booster, which is organic, okay? Not, not organic, inorganic. But this is a nice combination. It looks really good together. And I will tell you a little bit more about a couple of other things as we get into some pictures of them, okay? Um, next one. You might want to step to the door and tell them. Um, yeah, let's bring up the next one. Okay. Okay, this is an overview that I took just the other day. And actually, um, it isn't very clear. It's difficult to photograph some of these um, annual salvias because their the blooms are small, tall spikes with small blooms. But um, it's just, these plants are wonderful. And there's some new ones on the market. <laughs> there's a series, um, a new series that came out last year, maybe a few the year before that. But um, they're really long lasting and with a little dead heading will again go to frost. The, this series um, is gets big. It's three feet easily. I have a lot of containers there and it's really difficult to weave my way through them even. So let's see if we can get a close up of some of those, okay? Um, Danny, I can talk about this okay. for a few minutes if you want to step sure. forward, okay? Thank you. Do want, you. Do you want this? Yeah, okay. now that just oh, go just back, go back to go that, back that, okay? Okay, yeah. Okay, let's talk about this picture for just a few minutes. What, what actually is in this particular picture? Hyssop, anise, Hyssop is a great thing. Long blooming, but does need a little deadheading. And when we go away from this picture, I'm gonna to talk to you a little bit about that deadheading. Okay, so I've got that. Bees love that particularly, okay? And the butterflies, I'm getting a lot of butterflies now, which I'm pleased because they were a little late showing up, okay? And then there's the blue salvias. And there's a number of those um, we've got. Fortunately, we have a lot of these in stock right now, and so <laughs> you can still get it done. I think we're low, if not out, of the verbena, uh, not the verbena, um, although I'm not sure we have Benariensis, but the, the fuchsia Gartenmeister. But we have a lot of these salvias, and they are prime, prime plants. And I really do think that you will enjoy them. Um, I do like this agatash. Uh, it is a perennial, 
it's it's one that I'm not sure it would live over winter in a container because growing in containers over winter is different than growing in the ground, but it is a perennial. And on a mild winter, it may come through. I will find out this year, perhaps. Okay, there's also the blue and the red. There's some orange. Uh, this is called the Rockin' series. And it is rocking. I am so pleased with these. Let's come back to me for a second. This is of that rocking series. This is rocking deep purple. But there are some other shades in there. Now, does the hummingbirds come to purple? You better believe they do. They don't mind that it's not red, okay? And it's fun to have some of the other colors in the garden. It's a beautiful, beautiful flower. Minor, because I put them in early. Minor three feet tall, and just filled, filled with with uh, flowers. Okay, you need to keep it going, because annual's greatest ambition is to produce fruit. That's seeds for them, and when they've done that job, they may quit. So you're going to discourage that. You can see, hopefully, there, there's a little bud coming here. That's going to be the next bloom. And there's little buds coming here. That's the next bloom. And so yesterday I went out, and this is the blue one, and I cut, I deadheaded. This is finished. It needs to be cut away so that it doesn't produce seed. Where did I cut it? I cut it just above this growing tips. If you cut it right back to here, those tips will come out and be the blooms. These will come first because they're bigger. This is discouraging the setting of those seeds, but I love that rocking series. And then there's um, uh, blue, uh, another, a couple of other blue ones that are wonderful to bud and bloom and that sort of the funny names, you know. Okay, here, here's a couple of the others that are different colors. And this is what I cut away. That is what it looks like when it's ready to be cut. Because there's very little left there for them to get the pollen from. And so when you cut these away, the fresh will come. So that is deadheading, just for this plant, but for other plants too. And if I bring back this pentas, which is a wonderful thing, here again, you can see that these are the new babies that are gonna be coming in. That's where the bloom comes from. So if this is finished, which it is not, you would cut that back to here, okay. Now, you know, for those of you who, who've watched me before, I never vary from my tools. I value my tools. I don't want anybody borrowing my tools unless I know they're gonna bring them back. I won't be able to put my hand on it, know where it is. Joyce Gin Scissors. This is fantastic because it's quick and it's fast, okay? Wonderful, wonderful. I can't be without these scissors. Take care of them and you'll have them for a long, long time. This is the hyssop. And that one is pretty much finished. So mine needed a good haircut. The bees and the butterflies particularly go to this one. That gets cut right there. Easy to do. Okay. Let's come back to this stand. Let's move on to the next one. Okay, let's take a view. This is taken from the front, a different angle. And I wanna talk for a second about other complementary plants because it isn't just the pollinators. Um, you want those, but it's okay to have other things in it. You're often, we often talk about the thriller, the spiller, the filler, all that. And sometimes I follow that and sometimes I don't. But the Varus Carex, the, the grassy one that you see here, will tolerate a lot of sun because this gets a hot afternoon sun. Again, I lost the tree there and so now it's getting full afternoon sun. 
so it'll take it. But it also takes a lot of shade and it lives over, it is a perennial and it lives over in containers, which is a big plus. So that's a part of my year round thing. Now there is another plant that's in there that is also a perennial and you're seeing a mass of small blooms from a plant called Euphorbia Ascot Rainbow. And this one has lived over, the one you saw in that picture, this is its third year. So it lives over. Now we're talking about some larger containers here, okay? Now that blossom from that, which again attracts pollinators, has been in bloom from very early spring. And now, four months later, we, I'm, I'm cutting it back. I cut back some yesterday. I'll cut back the rest of it this evening. This particular plant, though, a little warning, euphorbia, it has a mucousy type that oozes when you cut it. So you want to wear gloves. You want to wear probably some of those throwaway plastic gloves that we've all kind of gotten accustomed to. Um, so use those when you're cutting it back because you don't, you don't know if you're going to be allergic to the, what oozes from that. But this is one magnificent plant and it is, it can be the upright in your pot year round. It is fantastic. Okay. While I'm here, let's mention a couple of other containers. I need to watch my time. Okay. I've got, I've got that. Let's mention some others that are just prime, prime. I happen to be very fond of orange, okay? And this is not a plant that we get in frequently, but we do have it right now. And it's Hymomalia, okay? Firebush, lime sizzler. So its foliage is, is yellow, more or less. And this little flower is orange, hummingbird magnet, but other pollinators also. Now it will get larger than this. You cannot beat lantana. Lantana is remarkable for drawing everything. And there are various colors in this, but look how pretty that is together. There, there is a contrast of textures with the flowers, which is great. Uh, complementary colors, which is great. While I've got the lantana in my hand, deadheading a lantana is important also when it's finished, because once it forms the seed heads, it does not bloom as well. So this one is almost finished and you just go, that's it, okay, deadhead once a week, every two weeks, that's fine. Now this gets large and that's great. And it love, it'll tolerate whatever hot sun you throw at it. Both of these things will. I went to the perennial section and I only want to use those long blooming, well, I'll leave this up here for the moment. These long blooming ones, this is a Gallardia, which is very attractive. And again, with some deadheading, it will bloom for a long period of time. It's one of those perennials that has a lot. Look how pretty this is together. We've got a contrast of sizes in the blooms, but is that pretty? I think it's pretty, but then I like orange, okay? And it won't hurt to throw in a little purple with that orange. Not bad, huh? So those are some of the things that you can combine. Now we're talking sun here. Those are plants that need sunshine. Doesn't need it 12 hours a day, six to eight hours. So when you see signs that say full sun, you can consider six to eight hours pretty much as full sun. There, this one I mentioned to you, the hyssop, a close cousin, the agastache, again in that orange, blooms for a long period of time, needs a little deadheading now and then. I can see some that's getting a little ragged here. Just go snip and get rid of some of the ragged. 
and, and you don't have to clear it all at once. Keeps going and there's something there that attracts things all the time. All right, here's another orange one that I wanna to talk to you about. Because it's again, as we said, hummingbird heaven. And this particular one is, a, the varietal name is Kuvia vermillionaire. It's a tiny little blossom, but the hummingbirds love it. And it blooms all season. And I haven't had to deadhead this one a lot, but you do have to check the deadheading just a little bit. And while we're talking about all these plants behind us, I have to absolutely talk about zinnias, okay? Zinnias are a draw for, oh, so many things, just wonderful. The butterflies love zinnias. And there's many different varieties. There's many different colors. They're fantastic. It's okay, Danny. We can, we can do all this. Okay. They're, they're doing some maintenance uh, in, in the uh, room next to us. So you're going to get just a little bit of noise from that. Okay, Danny, what have we got coming up next? Okay, we've gone past that one. A little bit of a close-up. You can see how difficult it is to film because they're very airy, okay? These are all those salvia. I want to encourage you to try these, and they are available right now because they're, they're just so interesting. Okay, Danny, let's keep, keep going with this because I, I want to talk uh, a little bit more about this is the blue one this is indigo spires but there are a couple other blues that are good too and in the next one i want to talk about some of the things that you could use in containers these happen to be in in the ground this is butterfly weed asclepius tuberosa in bloom right now and is the monarch uh caterpillar plant they eat this one so don't get disturbed if if you have it and somebody's eating it okay in front of that is my lavender which is in the ground I absolutely have to have lavender and I just went out over the weekend and completely cut back the dead blooms of the lavender I didn't do not cut lavender back into old wood it will not come out from it but you need to trim it back now because that's what keeps it tidy. So I trim it back just slightly into the foliage part of it. And it will usually come back out and bloom again in the fall, which is wonderful. So I don't mind having this as a container plant. And often I'll have it by itself because the foliage is wonderful and the fragrance is great and it will bloom twice a year. In the background, there is a Santalina and it is another interesting one too. Uh, again, a, a wonderful complimentary container plant because of its great foliage and it does bloom also. Okay, Danny, let's, let's wrap up some of this, okay. In ground, we're not gonna talk about this today but this is very exciting to me. If you have the space, check out the pollinators and, and plant some of these things, even in a small space. It's a corridor for these birds, bees, and butterflies. Even the ones that migrate will stop in. And the more we plant of these, the more little oasis that they have, the better. And when you do that, the next picture, then, which is the last one for the day, then you can enjoy all you. You're furnishing a livelihood. The birds, bees, and butterflies. They're going to pollinate your vegetables, and you'll have a lot to eat. But as much as anything else, you're absolutely going to enjoy it. All right, let's talk a little bit about some of the necessities of success with these plants. We talked about deadheading and that's maintenance, but there's a little more to it than that. I, number one, don't like to grow things in little pots unless they're in an area where I know that I can keep them watered. 
And when I'm working all day long and if they're in full sun, they may be too dry when I get home. So part shade works for smaller plants. Uh, but primarily everything that I grow is in a large pot. And they are mobile, by the way. Sometimes I may have to have some help, okay? But this is a good size pot. Could even be bigger. It's probably 18 inches. Very good. How do I do this? I'm just going to do a quickie with it. I always put a piece of, and it needs to be cut to fit in the bottom of here. This is a landscape fabric, and it helps keep the soil where it belongs, which is in the pot. And uh, I'll put a piece inside of here. To make this affordable, rather than you're having to buy a full big roll of this, we cut it in one yard pieces. So it's affordable, okay? So that's what I do with this. Into that, you need a good quality potting soil. Not soil from your garden, potting soil. I will reach for our Merrifield blend which is very good, okay? It is not organic. It does have a polymer in it, which helps somewhat with the moisture, but this is a great thing to use. I use it in all except my um, herbs. We do have a Spoma products and they make a good potting soil. This is an all organic one. And so if you're going all organic, that's a good one to choose. We have a lot of others that are very good potting soils. So into this, I will bring it to within a couple of inches of the top. You don't ever want to fill completely this pot with potting soil because then it makes it very difficult to water. And, you're, and when you water, it splashes out onto your deck or onto your patio. And you don't really want that either. So hold your soil always back from the top just a little bit. Into that, I usually mix uh, another Espoma product. I'm reaching for this. All organic plant tone. There's tomato tone that you can use on your tomatoes, although you don't have to. I've certainly, I've certainly kept big bags of this and used it primarily for everything, but there are some specifics with minor differences. There is garden tone, which is fine too. Usually I keep a good size bag, I plant on around and use it. I will put a good couple of handfuls in that size pot and I will thoroughly, thoroughly mix that with the soil. It is a slow release. It doesn't burn the root system. It works really well. Now, you will be watering these pots frequently. And so you're going to leach out these materials eventually. And these plants need fertilizer. They need some way to grow. They're in a container that's being washed out. So I choose, excuse me for having jump up. Um, this is inorganic, but it is great. It is very easy for all of these containers that I have except my herbs. And I use this blossom booster. Just follow the direction every couple of weeks and you will be giving those plants everything they need. You're gonna deadhead to keep them going the fertilizer keeps them going, okay? When you fill your pot with your plants, I often top that off then with a small gravel, like pea gravel, or like the little uh, Jack's stones, three eighths inch, and I put like a half an inch. Squirrels love to dig in soil that's bare, and that keeps, discourages them. Plus, when you're watering, the soil stays in the pot, okay? So I like to do that. There are liquid organics. This happens to be fish and seaweed mix. And so this is a good one every couple of weeks, which I use primarily for my herbs, okay? So that kind of covers the basic growing. Um, 
I might mention, if you'll hand me that, Danny. I do have deer. I do not spray my herbs. It's not necessary. The deer don't eat the herbs, thank goodness. And uh, my veggies and so forth, uh, edibles, are behind a, a fence, okay? I had to do that because you cannot spray Bob X or liquid fence, which is good also on those. If, if the deer don't want to eat it, neither do you. But this is the only reason I can have hasta and daylilies and some of the other things too. I use this according to the directions. Rain does not wash it off. Um, you need to spray more often in the early spring when you're getting active growth. But now I find that every three weeks is good enough, okay? Now, there's another product that I just quickly wanted to, I did want to leave some question time, but I'm running short. Um, maybe a lot of you don't know about mosquito bits. I, container garden, this is in containers. I have some attractive containers or I even have some tubs back in my work area that I fill with water. The water attracts the mosquitoes to lay their eggs. This is an all natural product. It does not hurt the bees, the birds, the butterflies, whatever. According to the directions, I put the mosquito bits into that water uh, every couple of weeks. And I've, I've seen them just working alive with thousands of these little mosquito babies. And if I put these in, within two or three hours, they're gone. So I set traps. That's not perfect. I'm going to have some mosquitoes after that, but it, it really cuts down on the numbers. So I just needed to share that with you before we move on. Sally, if I know we, we're running short, but maybe there'll be time for a couple of questions. Yeah, we have time and we have some questions coming in. So just a quick note to anybody, um, we're probably going to have more questions than we can answer. So if you have questions that you don't get answered during this class, you're welcome to hit reply on that confirmation email. That goes to me and then I can share it with Peg so that we can follow up with you after class. Um, so Peg, we'll dive in. Um, we've had a couple of people contacting us um, during the class. They're interested in hearing about, I know we had a couple of host plants that you discussed, um, but they're interested in hearing about if there's any native plants that are good that can go in containers if they want to try and support the local butterfly population. Well, I need to double check on some of these that, that are maybe natives, okay? Um, a lot of those are not long blooming, okay? Native plants are invaluable and I actually have many many native plants that were on my property or I've added to my property a lot of times their their trees are there and and believe me this is all a part of that uh, pollinator system okay which I didn't we were talking about container things today so I didn't get into that but there are trees that are natives there are shrubs that are natives um, and all of those come into bloom at their period. So within your ability with the space that you have, it is good to research which of those, for instance, I have Chianthus, the fringe tree, which blooms in the springtime and uh, is fantastic. It is native and it is also a tree that could be used in a relatively small space like a townhouse backyard. There are uh, buckeyes, there are so many different things that can be used um, as shrubs that come into bloom periodically. A lot of these annuals that I've talked about today um, aren't necessarily um, native, okay? Some certainly are, but um, primarily I'm looking for something that is going to give these birds, bees, and butterflies the pollen that they need and that help us with the pollination of our vegetables too. So I'm, I'm not, absolutely did not concentrate on uh, natives today, okay? That's very, very easy to find um, 
otherwise I, I just don't have the time to get into that right now yeah that's fine and i would say for anybody who's interested in that if you want to send me an email i do know we have a blog that we did with um terry uh last year he's someone who really is an expert in uh, hummingbirds and butterflies and we have a blog on some native plants so y'all can follow up with that or we'll talk to peg after um all right next question are some plant names to your left behind you on the the line the one with the lime green foliage and the one with the daisy like flower what are those two called this one is gallardia Okay. -A -L -L -A -R -D -I -A. I always so, forget yeah. the name of that one. It is a perennial, okay? You will find it. And the, the other one is a spurge. It's a euphorbia, E-U-P-H-O-R-B-I-A. And its varietal name is Ascot Rainbow. It is a perennial. All right, thank you. I'm typing this into the chat for anybody who's interested in the spellings of those. Okay. Um, Okay, so the next question, you showed some beautiful basils that were in bloom and we had a question about how do you get the basil plants through the hot summer when it once it reaches above 90 degrees, are they still, do they struggle or do you have a trick for keeping them going? They don't struggle for they, me. Well, in the heat? No, uh, you have to deadhead some if you really wanna keep it growing uh, for a long period of time. Although I certainly have had no, no issues with our regular basil. And I particularly love the Thai basil for the blossoms. So I, I set aside some that I keep deadheaded so that it'll really keep going for me to cook with. And then I set aside some that I let bloom and I deadhead periodically and, and they keep going for me even when it's hot, provided you don't let them go bone dry. They, that can, Finish them up, you know. Sounds so you good. You have to watch your watering when it hits ninety degrees above. Yeah. Oh, Water's the key. Got it. Oh, we had a note from someone who said they have basil that does great with morning sun, but doesn't like the hot afternoon sun, so they keep it in the morning sun. And then that's a good thing. That works. But, yeah. but right now, right. mine is getting full afternoon sun. That's good. Um, all right, next question is about a plant that was shown in one of your pictures and I always get it mixed up. So I wanted to double check the purple globe like flowers. Is that gomfrina in your garden or is that something else? It's gomfrina. Okay, I always get it mixed up. And so I said, I was like, I'm gonna double check on this cause I always think it's gomfrina and then it's not. It um, is. <laughs> and it's, a, I, I don't know that it's the greatest pollinator necessarily although I'm sure it is to some degree, uh, but it's one that I just enjoy adding into the mix. Yeah, I, I think it's a really cool looking flower. Um, what do you use to fertilize your herbs? I have used, as I mentioned, this plantain or garden tone, all produced by a stoma. Okay. It's very good. And then you can supplement that with uh, either another application of this periodically. Uh, it's slow release and it doesn't wash out as quickly. So I would say if you use plantone or garden tone, which is very similar, then you would only need to add some in three or four weeks. But I also enjoy this fish and seaweed thing following the directions every maybe three weeks. Herbs don't like to be heavily fertilized. Okay. So I, I stick with the organics with my herbs. All right, thank you. Um, okay, next question. So it's continuing on with the herbs. So if you're growing the herbs for the flowers to attract the pollinators, are the leaves still good for use once they start to flower or do they get tough? So are you sacrificing? To some small degree, you're going to be sacrificing. Okay. Um, yes. You will have more tender basil if you did hit. Okay. Um, I like to have some of both going on. Yes. Once it begins to flower, it isn't quite as tender as it was earlier, but I still use it. It still has the flavor, and I'm not munching on it a lot. So, yeah, <laughs> cooking with it. <laughs> that definitely makes a difference. Yes. Yeah. It That's does. good to know. Yeah. Um, okay, so the next question is about Tarenia, which you mentioned at the beginning of the class. Um, one of our attendees bought some Tarenia back in the spring. 
um, and it's struggling now. So do you have any recommendations? Is it time to deadhead it? Does she need to send Urania absolutely has to be deadheaded. Okay. Some of the newer varieties have to be deadheaded more heavily. I frequently grow the blues and the purples and, and um, they don't have to be deadheaded as much, but it's, uh, you have to watch which is the new blooms and which are the old ones and get rid of the old ones. Um, I have not found that to be fond of hot afternoon sun. I find that it does better for me if it gets morning sun and dappled light or shade in the afternoon. So doing that, deadheading and being sure that you do fertilize periodically is the key. Thanks, Peg. And do you have, I know you were discussing fertilizing, so we're covering a broad range of flowers here. Um, do you have a, a general rule of thumb? I know you had mentioned fertilizing every two to three weeks. Is that something that you recommend for most plants? I may have misheard that too. I, in, in containers. Yes. You're talking about in containers. Yes. The reason being, you're constantly watering. So you're constantly washing those nutrients away. Therefore, they need to be replaced. And every two, every couple of weeks is, is a good idea. I don't do that as often with the herbs because they don't need as much fertilizer. And I am using something that doesn't wash away as easily as a liquid feed might, okay? This is why I do go to the um, inorganic for a lot of my regular containers just because it's easy. I don't use this in the ground because I don't want to mess up the, the system there, okay? <laughs> Shall we say? Um, certainly, one can just stick with this kind of thing. You go organic all the way. You use the plant home, garden home, either one, and then you use the liquid every three weeks. You can do this with everything if you choose to go completely organic. There are so many fertilizers out there and, and they work. You just need to weave a little bit. And if you're unsure, please ask us. Okay. Sounds good, thank you. Um, all right, so for some of these annuals that you mentioned, do you ever overwinter them or do they all, is that something that you can do if you wanted to try with, with any of them? I know some of them, <laughs> could be, but what are your thoughts on that? Well, overwintering some of the annuals is not worth it in, in a lot of respects. Uh, certainly I do overwinter a lot of things. Primarily I overwinter my canna lilies, I overwinter my colocaceas, alocaceas, molds, that sort of thing, because sometimes they'll go through the winter, but a lot of times they won't. Cannas are more dependable than others. I'll overwinter my dahlias. Those are easy to do, and that's another day's program. Um, sometimes, if you have the space, you can protect those plants that are in containers, either by grouping them and wrapping them in bubble wrap up next to your house or with mulch bags around them, and may very well get them through the winter in their containers. But most of the plants that I talk about today, I, I would not overwinter. And I have, and I do overwinter a number of things, but it isn't these things that are behind me right now, unless it's perennial. You can take those salvias, and, and I'm going to try some of this. I, I, it depends upon what I have time to do, uh, to lift some of those out and, and bank them you know, maybe partly in the soil and cover them with um, mulch or uh, leaf compost. Uh, and maybe very well I'll get them through. I have overwintered outside the lavender in containers, but they need to be a decent size, at least that 18 inch one that we talked about. Okay. 
Thanks, Peg. All right, it is 101 now. Um, so we've gone just a bit over. For anybody who had questions about specific plants for deadheading, I know I see a few of those, a few more coming in. Um, just feel free to hit to follow up with us and we can get back with you on your specific questions. Um, notes for everybody, we will be sending out tomorrow um, a, a recording of the class, a survey. If you fill out the survey, there's a chance for a $50 gift card, I believe. Um, so please fill that out. That's helpful for us. And um, feel free again to hit reply on any of those confirmation emails. Send me a note with your question and we'll follow up with you. We'll either send it to Peg or if we need to talk native plants or anything, we'll get you where you need to go. Um, so Peg, thank you so much for joining us today. Do you have anything you'd like to follow to uh, close up with? Just simply with the deadheading thing, it is not complicated. Uh, it's just a matter of when you realize that that bloom is finished, take it back to the new growth. That's simple. Take it back to the new growth. Right there. Okay. Thank you. Yes, definitely. Thank you, good work. Um, thank you, Peg. All right, everybody have a great day and uh, keep an eye out for those follow up emails tomorrow with the information on the plant list and the recording. Everybody have a good day. Thank you and thank Bye, you. Bye, Peg. Bye-bye.